This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Now let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post game chart deck in your research roundup email. Now, if you don't have a research roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over David's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's cover crude oil. EIA inventory was delayed by the holiday, so nothing to report there. In the last few weeks, we've been from the high back in late May all the way around uh, just over $80 down to the $72 bottom and all the way back up now to over $81. So we're back above that late May high. Uh, I'm not a buyer here. I I don't think that the big structural supply demand imbalance that I definitely still predict is coming. uh, I think it's still probably a couple of years off. Right now in this moment, the market is more than adequately supplied but there's so much geopolitical uncertainty that you just you never know which way the uh the next move is going to go based on whether the next thing to happen is an escalation or de-escalation of geopolitical risk now eric i get your bigger macro view i also uh, think it's going to take a while for a really big upside on oil but i'm looking at it much more short term technically that was definitively a a short-term bottom formed when it went to retest the year lows. And since then, we've had a pretty strong 10% rally off the lows. And there's uh, constructive price action, including some reactions in gasoline to start to confirm this. Now, I'm not yet uh, looking for the next big bull market here, but this uh, if this ends up becoming not a short-term low, but an intermediate low, and we see uh, uh, any short-term selling immediately get bought on dips, particularly if the bulls can keep this uh, above the $78 level, keeping like all corrections down to $2, $3 on the downside. Uh, if we can see that kind of a consolidation, it may w- open the window in July for a retest of that uh, high from April, around $86 to $87. Now, what's interesting is that the energy stocks have not really responded to this yet. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, the coming weeks, uh, a trend starts to develop there. Nonetheless, let's move on to the S&P 500. Nick, I want to get you involved in this conversation. Let's just start off with you uh, talking about what levels you're watching on the S&P. Yeah, Patrick. So right now, SPX has a spot price of approximately 54.80. The implied move for the July 19th monthly OPEX is plus minus 130 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 56.10 and the lower implied move is 53.50. Right now, we have no key resistance as we're at all-time highs, and we have key support at 5,400. I'm inclined to think we see a run further to the upside a bit, perhaps, but it's important to note seasonality right now. So just for reference, in election years, the median return for August, September, October are 0%, whereas following the election, November, December, January, they're about 5.3%. Also to note that July, statistically over the last 100 years or so, has had the strongest period of market performance of any month of the year since 1928. And the NASDAQ has delivered a return on average in July over the last 16 years of 4.64% return. So interesting to note the seasonality overall right now. So I think we're going to see perhaps a push to the upside into July, followed by a flat-ish segment into the election time period. Interesting observations there, Nick. I uh, also think that on the short term, we can go higher. But the interesting thing is, is that we're entering a, a, what I think is the parabolic phase of the rise. And uh, what it might be is that uh, it might all be pulled forward to uh, these last weeks of June where that big upside is. And, and July uh, may uh, see it already peter out because it just seems to be accelerating here. So on page four and five, I wanted to just highlight two things. First of all, S&P just ripping to the upside. But 
it, the upside is coming on deteriorating market breadth. So looking at the market breadth to the start of the year, we were at 90 per plus percent uh, in January of stocks participating on the upside. By March peak, we were at 85 percent. By the May peak, we were at 65 percent. And here we are with the S&P 500 ripping to an all-time new high with new momentum with only 49 percent of stocks participating on the upside in the S&P 500. So we have continuously divergent market breadth happening. And that's largely because this rally has literally become focused on simply the handful of mega cap stocks that have gone parabolic. And uh, the number one of that is NVIDIA. Obviously, Microsoft and Apple both contributing to this. But NVIDIA has been uh, the AI story and the one that has really driven this. And it's such a behemoth that it, and a, a big market cap component of this market that it is alone carrying this S&P 500 higher. And this is why I um, am going to make the call that where we see NVIDIA's peak, it's going to be the high of the S&P 500. We already have seen the peaks come in on many other indices. Take the uh, Russell. The Russell is nowhere near its March highs. Uh, we ha take the equal weight S&P 500, where it equal weights all of the components, not making new highs. You take the uh, um, Dow Jones, which is price weighted, nowhere near its March highs. And so you have a scenario where this uh, index is literally just being carried by this. So the question, of course, is will NVIDIA peak? And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, the, you, you can't short this stock. Of course, you can't short it. But the point is, is that um, these excesses almost always correct. And I think the best thing to do is refer back to Bob Farrell's 10 rules of investing. I want to just highlight five of them that I think apply to today's market really well. And it's an important one to always remember. Excess is in one direction will lead to an excess in the opposite direction. The next one is there are no new eras. Excesses are never permanent. The next one is exponential rapidly rising or falling markets usually go farther than you think, but they never correct by going sideways. Uh, the next one is the public always buys the most at the top and the least at the bottom. And the last one I want to reference is fear and greed are stronger than long-term resolve. And really the point of this is that NVIDIA is in this exponential phase. And the, on the chart, I'm showing the slope of the acceleration. And it literally, we could see NVIDIA within even a couple of weeks hit 150, 160. I'm not here calling the market top today, but it is in the exponential phase. And when NVIDIA ultimately reaches that point of exhaustion, it's not gonna correct sideways. And when NVIDIA, uh, blows off that top, it's going to e uh, be the same time the S&P 500 puts in its top. And so it'll be interesting to see, Nick, whether or not that uh, happens going into July, or maybe it does last into the first few weeks of July uh, to kind of put that scenario in play. Anyway, let's move on to the NASDAQ. What levels are you watching on the queues? So right now in the queues, spot price is approximately 486. And we have an implied move for the July 19th monthly OPEX of plus minus 17 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 503, and the lower implied move is 469. Right now, we have no key resistance as we're at all-time highs, and key support resides at around 460. As you mentioned about the market breadth, one thing interesting to look at right now is the total value of the S&P right now is approximately $44 trillion. And right now, the top 10 companies comprise almost $20 trillion, which is kind of insane when you think about it, because the top 10 companies essentially are almost equivalent in value to the remaining 490 companies. So I'm not so sure it's really important to look at the breadth overall, because as you said, the larger names like NVIDIA, for example, if they falter, the market will have a very tough time remaining higher. So again, my thesis is that we see a push toward the highs into the middle of July, followed by a stagnation period into the, the election cycle overall. If you're looking to hedge your portfolio and you want to remain long, it's never been cheaper really to hedge your portfolio overall. So it makes sense to take some risk uh, off the table by buying some insurance perhaps, if you want to try and chase that incremental upside. 
Yeah, to, to your point, when we look on page eight, that volatility index, the VIX remains at the 12 handle right along the year lows. And uh, and so right now, no one seems to be worried about anything. It's a complacent market and volatility premiums are very low, making those very in those insurance premiums very cheap. Uh, what levels are you watching on the VIX? So right now with the VIX at a 12 handle, we can expect to see intraday top to bottom moves of about 0.75%. Over the last few weeks, we've seen very, very muted movement overall intraday. And as we mentioned, if the mega caps do start to falter overall, the market should, should roll over a bit and that would cause a correlating spike in the VIX itself. As I mentioned previously, insurance right now is very cheap looking out to September, October, November timeframes. And if one is to be inclined to remain long in their portfolio in its entirety and not take any profits off the table, it would be wise to probably buy some insurance. Now, moving on to page nine, we have the US dollar index. Patrick, what are your thoughts here? The U.S. dollar continues to show strength. The U.S. dollar yen heading up to 160. In spite of all the yen bulls out there, it's resiliently climbing higher. At the same time, you have the euro breaking down because of all the political pressures. The U.S. dollar is finally starting to uh, to turn up here. Watching that high from a week ago around the 105.50 is going to be really interesting. Uh, if we see a proper breakout in that, uh, the next resistance level is at 106.5, and then you can really see uh, a potential U.S. US dollar bull market really ensue. What's interesting is that will the dollar rising correspond with inevitably some sort of risk off cycle in the markets? And so if the markets uh, rip higher for weeks to come, maybe the dollar stays sluggish a little bit, but it'll be interesting to see whether a US dollar strength lines up with that. And moving on to page 10, we had that gold futures chart. What are your thoughts here, guys? Well, we're in a sideways consolidation and seasonality in gold works against us until the end of August or so. So there's a good argument to be made that we're just going to continue uh, to consolidate sideways. So where's the bottom of that consolidation range? Where should you be buying the dip if we get it? Uh, the continuation chart would say 2285 is the number. That level doesn't exist on the contract chart. The contract chart says 2269. That's the 100-day moving average. And it's a fairly sharply rising 100-day moving average. So that number is going to get higher. Now, I can say with confidence that in crude oil, when the contract and continuation charts don't agree, it's the front month futures contract and the contract chart that's the one to follow. Uh, I don't know whether that carries over to gold. If it does, uh, that would suggest that 2270, maybe 2275 by the time we get there, is uh, the, the number to target as to where the uh, the bottom might be this summer. There's a good argument to be made that we're going much higher, but probably not until after Labor Day. My overall macro stance is I'm bullish on gold. And the interesting thing is that this consolidation is normal. Whenever you have a rise, uh, this, there's always a secondary corrective phase where it backfills and retraces that prior rise. And we're in the midst of some sort of a correction. That correction, in my mind, can definitely go head down to that level you were mentioning, 2269, 2250 is even possible. Uh, I think all dips should be bought. And uh, inevitably, when the right catalysts appear, then uh, gold should have have a continuation on the upside. But right now, expecting it to do a little bit more of a grind, and we'll be looking for where that next uh, buy on dip really shapes up. Moving on to page 11, we have that uranium chart. Eric, what are your thoughts here? Well, I think the market is trying to find a bottom here. I should say, I hope it's trying to find a bottom. Several of the uranium mining shares fell below their 200-day moving averages, and most of them then recovered. Uh, the charts are still looking kind of risky, though, actually quite risky. The key to this is when the very illiquid and, frankly, uh, easily at risk of manipulation spot market for uranium, when that market starts to move with some momentum and some volume to the upside, that's when the next really big leg in this nuclear renaissance story is going to take off. But the thing is, the rumor is the buyers just aren't worried about this. They think the price is about to retrace to the downside and they're going to be buying their uranium at the end of the summer at $50 or something. Um, I think they're going to be proven wrong and badly wrong and they're only going to be injuring themselves. But they can easily afford to just take the summer off 
and uh, go on strike and not buy anything. If that happens, there's plenty of room, especially if there's any kind of hiccups or air pockets in the broader market. There's plenty of room for these stocks to take out their 200-day moving averages to the downside. If that happens, the charts are going to start to look really ugly. Eric, when looking at that Sprott Uranium Physical Trust chart on page 11, it had a very aggressive sell cycle that was very much driven by the close end fund and not really reflective of what was happening in spot prices. It was trading at a material discount uh, to where spot prices were. And now we're seeing that mean reverting on the chart. And therefore, I don't really want to technically weigh in on the little rally we had here in the last um, week. Uh, but what will be interesting to me is when will we see the, uh, that uh, uh, lows are being established and that the spot prices start to turn up. And right now, that's not there. But I generally uh, remain quite bullish uranium looking for the next continuation pattern to break out at some point, which it hasn't yet, but it'll be uh, interesting in the month to come where that signal comes. Finally, I wanted to wrap up on page 12, though, with the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. And um, we uh, put in last year that high near the 5% yield. And uh, this time around, we hit about 470 uh, on the yield uh, back in April before it started to roll over. With the fact that we are seeing inflation calming down and seeing weak economic data, it's entirely plausible that these are going to be the highs of the year for the yield. It's not that there can't be a bond bear market in the years to come, but I think at this point, uh, the 10-year Treasury yield is a bit of a safe haven uh, during uh, the upcoming period. And so I think uh, having some of these treasuries, I'm not really looking for an extraordinary bull move, but it it really don't I don't think there's much downside here in picking up this yield and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether we see yields make it down to 4% or lower in the months to come. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>